Today we'll talk about a topic of great importance in the new COVID-19 pandemic era. Now more than ever, we value our health. How does nutrition play a role in health maintenance and what does immunity truly mean? Let's look at this in three parts and I'll stop after each part to take a few questions. First, we will look at immunity, how it is affected by age and nutrients to support its efficacy. And then the microbiome. And then finally, we'll pull it all together to optimize well being from a nutrition perspective. The three M's of nutritional health is a way of describing these three aspects. First, let's look at diet pattern and immunity. Immunity changes with age and overall health status. Chronic inflammation or inflam aging is recognized as having a net negative effect. The second micro M refers to microbiome, which are different regions and different patterns. Um, for example, in the mouth or the digestive tract or the skin, each has a different unique pattern that is for us, for each person, and changes uh, with age and with diet. So we'll go into a little depth about that. And then we'll also look at the third M, which will be about mindfulness and how integrative medicine supports immunity, health, and well being. So the immune system is how we define and delineate self from not self. It provides our unique molecular identity and is constantly in flux as we attune to our environment. Innate or natural immunity contrasts with adaptive immunity, which is acquired or specific. The main cell types involved are called B and T cells and are named for their origin. B from bursa or bone marrow, and T from thymus, a small gland in the center of the chest. Humoral immunity is from the serum or bodily fluids in contrast to cellular. Passive immunity is exemplified by an infant receiving its learned or acquired immunity by a breast milk. This is thought to act as a starter culture for a baby's microbiome. Active immunity develops after exposure to a disease or as a result of a vaccination. The new practice of providing plasma derived antibodies donated from those who have survived COVID-19 to those who are infected would be an active immunity provided in a passive manner. In health, Immune cells define us in a dynamic state of recognition of potential pathogens, removal of harmful or potentially toxic agents, and maintenance of functional mucosal barriers. The gut mucosal lining is of special importance in this. B cells formed in the bone marrow are active in the fluids, and T cells are found in both fluids and as discrete cells. Nutrients needed for healthy white cell production include protein, essential fatty acids, vitamins, and minerals. Recognition of cells involves polysaccharides as glycoproteins and glycolipids. These help to form receptor recognition patterns and are essential parts of any healthy immune action. So the main vitamins here are the Bs, vitamin C, A, and D, and we'll get into a little bit more depth about D later on. And then the main minerals are especially zinc, but also magnesium, iron, boron, and selenium. Many of us are familiar with blood tests. These tests accompany most health checkups and are repeated for cancer patients every time they receive chemotherapy. A CBC or complete blood count quantifies how many white cells or leukocytes are being formed 
and by uh, detected by spinning or separating out the white cells from the red cells and platelets. Further separation helps identify if one particular type of white cell is out of normal range. An example might be an elevated white count and a higher percentage of eosinophils, which may indicate allergies. Also, there is a ratio of NLR or neutrophils to lymphocytes that if it's extremely high, like over 18, then that might indicate um, a lot of inflammation, such as might be in involved with the COVID-19, what we call cytokine, cytokine storm. In health, it, the ratio is usually between one and three. Immunity in disease includes altered numbers of cells, inefficient recognition of pathogens, and is um, one aspect of disease. Autoimmunity is when our immune system sees self as not self or foreign and attacks our own cells as though they were harmful. Allergies are when our system overreacts by distorting production of cells and a lack of tolerance results. Cancers may arise due to mutations inside some cells that affect healthy immune recognition and response. Here are some examples of cancers of the immune system. During birth, initial inoculation of the microbiome begins and an infant's digestive system starts to learn about its environment. Colostrum is a rich source of recognition proteins called immunoglobulins and is found in the milk of mammals for the first day, few days after birth. Developmental windows are short periods of life when the environment plays a vital role in programming later life immunity. In utero, in the first few months of life and at puberty are thought to be such time periods when the environment affects immunity in a profound and lasting manner. Maturity of the immune system is thought to occur at about 18 years of age. However, vaccine boosters to protect against some pathogens may be needed throughout life. Immunity changes with age and defenses lose flexibility and diversity over time. Immunosenescence is the term to describe how immunity decreases with age. We know, for example, that it is those who are over age 60 who run the greatest risk of serious side effects from this coronavirus. T cell activity and an ability to maintain health increases until adulthood, then decreases over the age of 60. T cells are divided into two main groups, CD4 plus or T helper and CD8 plus or T suppressor cells. A balance of each is required for health. T cells are a very active area of immunity research right now, and there are many subsets being recognized, including the incredibly important memory T cells. Inflammation is a normal part of an acute immune response to a pathogen. It describes how white cells may migrate to an area under attack to bring heat, activity, and possibly result in swelling before resolution and healing. Chronic inflammation is associated with a variety of conditions, including autoimmune conditions, some viruses, and certain forms of body fat called visceral adipose tissue found in the center of the body of those who are overweight or obese. This is sometimes called belly fat and is a health risk in contrast to fat found on the thighs, which is more of a beauty risk. Cancer risk is associated with chronic inflammation. Beneficial nutritional components, also called bioactives, may help balance under and over production of inflammation. 
And that's why we focus a lot on anti-inflammatory foods. And we'll talk about some of those in a moment. Foods that support healthy immunity contain sulfur amino acids, including a relatively rare peptide called gamma glutamyl cysteine, found in egg whites and whey protein. This peptide is important for T cell production. Oxidative stress is an imbalance between oxidation and antioxidation. And this is best resolved with high antioxidant foods such as berries and other darkly pigmented fruits. Anti-inflammatory rich foods include salmon and other oily fish, as well as walnuts. A teaspoon of walnut oil added to salad dressing, for example, is a great way to add anti-inflammatory precursors to your diet. And this is because walnuts are the richest of all nuts in omega-3 ALA. Healthy nutrition is a balance of nutrients and energy. Too many calories without enough nutrients may result in excess body fat, especially in the center of the body, the so-called belly fat. This type of fat is associated with chronic inflammation. Malnutrition also may result in chronic inflammation due to inefficient and ineffective immunity. A pattern of eating that is most consistently associated with health and longevity is called the Mediterranean diet. No, you don't have to live in Italy, Spain, or Greece to enjoy its benefits but plenty of extra virgin olive oil is a key feature. Other key features of this eating pattern are a moderately high intake of fish, a low intake of dairy products, meat and poultry. There are no refried or processed foods and very limited amounts of added sugar. Naturally occurring sugars in fruit and honey are consumed in small quantities only. So let's stop here and I'll take a couple of questions. <coughs> Excuse me. Sent in um, earlier was, are there foods or supplements which can help us, uh, <coughs> can help bolster a lower than normal white cell count? which has remained low since um, radiation and lumpectomy. This, um, so if we think back to the um, slides that we looked at in terms of foods, let me go back here. Here we see these are foods, uh, these are nutrients that are important for uh, forming healthy white cells. For many people, it's getting enough protein. Um, the minimum amount of protein most people need is about 40 to 45 grams. That is equivalent to approximately five to six ounces of fish or chicken, or about um, three times the weight of food in terms of plant-based proteins, something like beans or quinoa. Those are not as protein dense, so you actually have to eat more foods to get that amount of protein. But getting enough protein is a very important part of um, generating sufficient white cells. And the other thing is that protein rich foods are usually rich in the B vitamins and the other minerals that we're also looking at. So for this person, I would wanna make sure that she's getting sufficient protein um, and maybe taking a B vitamin a supplement and then we would need to look at her blood work to see is there anything that might be out of range? For example, if the iron is too low, then maybe her hemoglobin is, is, is lowered. That would be the, the thing that we would do most. And then there was another question that was asking about um, uh, different types of juices and how to enhance uh, vegetable intake by having juices. So juices are great as long as they have the fiber in them. If the fiber is taken out, then you're missing a lot of the benefit of the juices. 
and um, but I have a few juice recipes I'll be happy to share at the end of this. Um, but in general, mixing some vegetables and some fruits is a good idea. And if you relying on a juice in, in the morning instead of breakfast, then I would add a vegetable um, protein powder to that to boost it up a little bit. Okay, so let's move to the next part of the talk. And um, so now we'll look at the second M of nutritional health. High resolution imaging and new detection methods have expanded our understanding of immunity, adding trillions of microbes at the interface between self and not self. Let's look at how these microbes exist in various ecosystems, with a special focus on the gut microbiome, or those microbes that live in the large intestine. Healthy microbiomes are also known as microbiota, which is the technical plural for microbiome, and are central to nutritional health. Here we see how all components are linked together to support wellness. So everything from your diet, activity, um, is all linked together here. And the probiotics, the fiber, and the enzymes are all slightly different, but they contribute to a healthy probiotic, a pro, the healthy microbiome in the, in the gut. The gut microbiome is sometimes called the hidden organ. It is estimated to weigh approximately the same as the brain, or about three pounds. There is a symbiotic relationship between us as hosts and the microbes. Each of us has an individual and distinctive pattern. In fact, there's some research going on in the UK looking at identical twins that find that even identical twins have a different response to different foods, and that is based on their different microbiome. Each of us um, has this individual one, and of course it is affected by travel, by antibiotics and many other factors. And about 65% of the cells are actually found lying in the GI tract in what is called payers patches or gut associated lymphoid tissue, also known as GOLT. And so the lining of the GI tract hosts these microbes and they add a complexity to the way we define on a absolutely dynamic everyday moment by moment, self from not self. Rob Knight at UC San Diego has very kindly shared this information from the Micro Setter Initiative. This is an international collaboration to learn more about the microbiome with a new focus on SARS-CoV-2, the virus causing COVID-19. Citizen scientists donate samples from fecal, nasal, oral, and skin swabs. And this graph shows that how we, those who eat um, more than 30 different species, which is this line here and the pink one at the bottom, this is the most sensitive and provides the most diversity. But even the duration of sleep plays a role. So age, exercise, these things too. But it is not just our diet, it's also our lifestyle. Microbes or germs may be helpful or harmful. A pathogen is one that causes disease, whereas a probiotic supports health. Microbes such as yeasts and bacteria that ferment foods have been found in archaeological digs wherever humans have ever existed. And mitochondria, the cellular powerhouses that generate energy in each of our cells, they may have derived evolutionarily from internalized bacteria, and they share many features with bacteria, which is thought provoking. Bad germs or pathogens have characteristics such as severity of impact, how we are infected, and how long we have immunity or protection. Good germs or probiotics support our health. And the bifido and lactobacillus are the most commonly used in cooking. 
SARS-CoV-2 is a new virus that our immune system has not seen before. It is a coronavirus, a group that makes up about 25% of the kinds of viruses that cause the common cold. Tests to detect the viral particles can tell if you have an active infection, even in the absence of symptoms. And serological tests can detect a response to a viral infection. There is an interaction between T and B cells, and memory T cells are thought to play an important role in recovery and immunity. And it is the neutralizing antibodies that the tests um, are, most in, are most important, in, especially in terms of a vaccine. We're not just having antibodies, they need to be neutralizing. As the gut microbiome plays a key role in health, it makes sense to focus on foods to support gut microbiome diversity and health. And here's some foods that support gut microbiome health, including those of prebiotics, which support the microbiome, and um, uh, beans, nuts, seeds, and vegetables. And this is just a, a little idea that you, you get steel cut oats is better than the rolled, and uh, some fermented vegetables may also be helpful. Dietary fiber or prebiotics not only provide nutrients for probiotics to thrive, they also delay the entry of simple sugars into the bloodstream flattening the curve of circulating glucose and sensitizing cells to an insulin response. This lowers the glycemic load of a meal or snack. So basically, whenever you eat, try to include some fiber at the same time. And that way, um, we know that uh, you will um, have a chance to support your microbiome. So I have a question here. What are the best foods to eat to avoid intestinal issues such as constipation and support gut health? So the types of foods that help with constipation are the foods that contain the dietary fiber, but especially fiber that's called insoluble fiber. So that's something that's more like bran from whole grains um, or brown rice. In opposed, as opposed to something like oatmeal or applesauce, which might be better for treating diarrhea. That's richer in what we call soluble fiber. And also it's important to stay very well hydrated. Um, I do think that there, sometimes people get confused with the types of foods that are healthy, which may be supporting uh, having less diarrhea, and then in the end that may be more constipating, or vice versa, people who um, have uh, foods that they think might be helpful with one and then it leads to the other. So um, exercise is important, especially things like yoga, where you're twisting and moving, because the colon tends to be somewhat passive, and the more you move, the more it's moving, and then that will help with constipation. Um, there are things that will pull fluid into the colon, such as magnesium taken at bedtime, sometimes may be helpful too. Okay, so let's move to the next slide. And um, here we're going to be looking at the um, third M of nutritional health. And we may see this as a challenge that is a motivator for us to help us to focus on optimizing our health. Let's look at what we can do now at a personal level to enhance resilience. And resilience is really how we fluctuate and improve and change and enhance and move forward with our lives um, in, in as much health as possible. So what food choices are smart for us to make? We saw in the first section how immune cells need protein, essential fatty acids, vitamins and minerals, and we suggested a few foods that might support immune health. In terms of protein, we need approximately six ounces of fish or chicken, or about three times that volume of a plant-based protein-rich food like quinoa, say. 
And it's important not to be thinking too much in terms of numbers, but just enjoyment. Even if we're having a dinner party virtually using Zoom, let's enjoy the food, the taste, the texture, everything about it. Um, I do have an immuno soup recipe, which is part of the Cancer Center Nutrition Center Handbook, which has about 100 recipes that I have written um, and is available on Amazon and is also available, that recipe is available at a link towards the end of this presentation um, through our website, Simsman UCLA website. So what health statistics or data would be helpful for you to know at this time? There are some modifiable risks, such as waist circumference and half your height or less is a simple guideline, but tell us if you have any of that belly fat or not. And of course, we want to try and avoid that because that leads to chronic inflammation, which we know is not good. High blood pressure is another risk factor. Glucose control, as estimated by hemoglobin A1c, fasting glucose itself, and fasting insulin if the first two are elevated. Vitamin D appears to be especially important. Um, several observational studies of COVID-19 risk and vitamin D levels in multiple countries have linked low vitamin D with higher risk of severe disease and mortality. Ongoing studies will continue to clarify this uh, apparent relationship. Blood lipids, such as cholesterol and triglycerides, are also useful to know. If triglycerides are high, this affects the viscosity of the blood. And this may also affect COVID-19 symptoms. Age, ethnicity, and blood type are non-modifiable factors, but are of value in assessing your risk. For example, if you're over 60 of African-American or Latino descent and not blood group O, you may be at a higher risk for severe symptoms. We are learning more about the risk factors every day, but knowledge is power, and it's important for us to try to triage which of an immunotype, which is a newer way of thinking, who may or may not be at a higher risk for severe side effects. And then, of course, different treatments would apply. Let's say you are at a higher risk for COVID-19, severe symptoms. What would you do? So here's some things from the CDC. Stock up on supplies, take everyday precautions. Of course, we know if you're in an area that's well ventilated, like being outside, then you're in much safer than if you're in an internal environment where the air is consistently circulated. So um, wear a mask, of course, that goes without saying because that makes a huge difference. And even maybe eye covering um, or a visor. Let's um, say, um, how do we put this all together in an integrated nutrition way? Well, one thing would be to focus your immune system on what it needs to be focusing on. So let's not add in additional toxins or other components to the diet. Um, add colorful vegetables, olives, nuts, and um, fruits and culinary herbs, because these are especially good, have been known for centuries to provide a whole lot of anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, and anti-carcinogens what I call the three A's. We also want to enhance natural immune health and resilience and by choosing berries and mushrooms often and having omega-3 rich foods daily and drink lots of tea, tea is good. Anyone from the UK will tell you that. Um, mindful self-care, <sighs> sleep, quiet, safe room makes a big difference. Sleep is when all the repair work takes place. There are some, these are some fruits and vegetables best purchased organic to lower pesticide exposure and also reduce potential dietary toxins. The Environmental Working Group is, um, publishes these every year. So if you do get infected, um, these are some foods that have anti-inflammatory and anti-coagulant activity. 
chia seeds, walnuts, and bat seed oil, very rich in ALA, the omega-3. Salmon, herring, sardines, oily fish, rich in DHA and EPA. And all of these herbs and spices, they all have benefit in terms of helping your immune system and your overall health, should you be infected. Intermittent fasting may be helpful, especially for those who have uh, either prediabetes or more of an issue with blood sugar and insulin. Fluids, of course, plenty of fluids. But the main thing everyone has uh, expressed is that they are exhausted, wiped out, and that's because the immune system is working so hard. So rest and relaxation is the absolutely number one thing to do. Immune responses include cell breakdown, release of metabolites, and recycling and removal of cellular components. Detoxification is a term used for removal of what is not helpful for new healthy cells. And the microbiome plays a central role in overall well being and recovery. Foods that support recovery provide nutrients to provide. Glutathione. Now that may be a new word for you. Glutathione is a very, very important part of liver and kidney detoxification processes. Egg whites, whey protein, and avocado are excellent sources of the precursor that I mentioned earlier, the peptide gamma glutamyl cysteine. And other foods containing glutathione include vegetables from the garlic and the cabbage family, asparagus, and watermelon. So recovery depends on a strong foundation built on wellness principles of sleep and relaxation, protein and hydration. So let's look at sleep and relaxation. The early morning hours are peak times for DNA and RNA repair. So we need to be peaceful and quiet at that time. This is not a good time to be reading scary stuff on the internet or video games or anything. This is a time to be resting. And as Dalai Lama says, sleep is the best meditation. How would you add extra protein? Well, here are some suggestions. As I said before, the goal is about 60 to 80, but you definitely don't want less than about 40. So that's about six to eight ounces of fish or chicken, or here's some ways, other ways to add it. Tofu, hard eggs, these are also useful things. And hydration. COVID-19 is affecting um, the sense of smell and taste for many people. Apparently, it's not affecting the nerves itself. It's the messages to the nerves. So um, hopefully that is recovered. But if you're not finding fluids appealing, it's a good idea to appeal to the other senses, like the visual senses and textures, things like that. And here are some suggestions for that. So let's build on this foundation here with sleep and relaxation, protein and hydration, with vegetables from the cabbage and the garlic family and berries. So the garlic and cabbage family um, contain sulfur compounds which can help to process with the detoxification. Key components of health, especially when immunity is ramped up. And berries also of all kinds, especially with the dark pigments, can help immune functioning. Elderberries have a long tradition of being used as therapy for influenza and cold viruses. It, many people focus on dietary supplements. However, these are not helpful without a strong foundation. Vitamin D may be beneficial for those whose serum level is low, for example. However, too much vitamin D may be pro-inflammatory, which in fact would be counterproductive. So it's a good idea to get yours measured and if necessary, supplement. But for most people, it's probably safe to take 25 micrograms or 1,000 units a day as vitamin D right now, given that we know that there is some benefit in preventing COVID-19. So with... <coughs> Now, having looked at this entire thing together, we can see here that um, the third M, a 
that mindfulness also relates to mindful eating. And this practice optimizes the first digestion phase of digestion, also known as the cerebral or brain-centered phase. By focusing on smell, taste, and texture, we honor and value the nourishment offered. A blessing or other ritual may also be valuable. This is how we attune ourselves daily for our well-being. So the three M's of nutritional health can now be seen in one piece. So we have the Mediterranean, anti-inflammatory type of diet, the microbiome should be uh, full of variety, and the mindful eating. As Albert Einstein once said, there are only two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle. The other as though everything is a miracle. So here's a link for the recipe for immuno soup from the Cancer Nutrition Center Handbook. And if you're interested in research on nutrition and lifestyle and COVID, um, I highly recommend you visit this link here. This is a large group of people who have been participating in earlier studies, current going, ongoing, um, including the American Cancer Society Cancer Prevention Study, which are three, which I've been part of for the last 10 years, I think it is. And they're measuring all sorts of um, bodily fluids, weight, um, and long-term outcomes. And then there is also an app available, so every day you can check in and tell how your, uh, how your health is. And um, I just want you to say, this, is, um, this webinar is provided by the, our integrative oncology team at the Simsman UCLA Center. And we are part of the umbrella UCLA Health Integrative Medicine Collaborative, when this is our hopeful new home in Santa Monica in a few years. And this is um, a wonderful patient-focused health initiative from UCLA to offer the best care to our patients as possible. And this is where you can reach me and see our uh, very resource-rich website and also see that, um, download that, uh, immuno soup recipe. Thank you so much. I will now take some more questions which have been sent in and um, we will address those now. <laughs>